Welcome back to Feminism, Fascism and the Future. I'm Alison Seeger, and in the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about the anti-gender ideology movement in Mexico and feminist and queer resistance to it. And hi, everyone. I'm Lori Essig. And last June, I went with my colleagues Catherine Wright and Patricia Saldariaga to Mexico City to find out how the anti-gender movement in Mexico is gaining ground, even as the feminist movement has really taken off. But before we go to Mexico City, let's talk about some news from the front lines of the war against gender. Since we made our last episode, things seem to have gotten even worse in Russia. Putin's regime is now arresting people for any public queerness. As our colleague Alexander Kondakov explained in episode two, at the end of 2022, the Russian government passed new laws that make any public displays of non-traditional sexual relations a form of political extremism, as well as laws prohibiting both gender-affirming care and any changing of public records to align them with someone's gender identity. People who own gay bars have been arrested for engaging in so-called extremism. At this point, even displaying rainbow flags can be an offense, which is punishable by up to 12 years in prison. Take that in. Meanwhile, in Florida, things may have actually gotten a little less awful. Maybe. After a lawsuit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union to clarify the infamous Don't Say Gay law, Florida agreed that teachers can discuss LGBTQ issues in the classroom and that measures meant to protect LGBTQ students from harassment and bullying are legal. What you still cannot do in Florida is make any LGBTQ issues part of instruction or teach any books where the character's queerness is not incidental but central. Still, a win's a win, and at least Florida teachers can't be fired for displaying a photo of their same-sex spouse. And in the two steps forward, three steps back, TikTok is a buzz right now with news of Project 2025. This 900-plus plan of action from the ultra-conservative Heritage Foundation aims to create a Trump presidency that is ready to go on day one of his administration by amassing a cadre of loyalists and also dismantling many of the regulatory functions of the state. Project 2025 says that what's wrong with America is wokeness and gender ideology. And so it goes after the usual list of suspects. Critical race theory, the so-called transgender agenda, gay marriage, and of course, reproductive rights. Here's Congress member Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez breaking Project 2025 down. I want to be very clear that this was intentional and that this is exactly what Republicans have been going for. We've seen it, they've made, you have the Heritage Foundation, you have lots of folks who are on record saying, you know, not only do they wanna go after abortion, not only do they wanna go after reproductive freedom, they're going after IVF, they're going after contraception. We have a Mifepristone uh, ruling that is, that is coming down from the Supreme Court and Clarence Thomas enriching himself from the same folks who are saying that they are trying to control women's bodies quite explicitly and going beyond that. They also want to control recreation, what they call recreational sex. Yes. Recreational sex. This is, this is so clearly a patriarchal theocracy that has embodied itself in the DNA of an entire political party in the United States of America. And as women and as any non-binary and queer person in this country, they must be defeated. They, they, there should never be room for this kind of control by force of a, over another person's body in this country. And they can walk it back as much as they want. They have done this. They, who put those judges there? Not Democrats, yeah, not yeah. independents. Republicans put those judges in there. Republicans are taking women's bodies by force, and we cannot let them do it. It has to come to an end. I mean, you didn't expect me to end this introduction on an optimistic note, did you? No. <laughs> this is feminism, fascism, and the future, after all. And as much as we believe a different world is possible... We also believe we are in the fight of our lives against fascistic forces that would eliminate LGBTQ people, feminists, 
and create even worse forms of oppression for anyone who is not white and Christian and a legal citizen. But don't despair. TikTok is on it. And if TikTok is on to Project 2025, soon the whole world will know about it and be ready to fight against it. Now, let's go to Mexico. Laurie, what did you and your colleagues find there? Interestingly, I think what we found there was feminist joy. Mexico City is a place that felt really hopeful to us. Of course, there's a patriarchal culture and sickeningly high levels of femicide. That is, misogynist violence against women and girls. Some have even called Mexico a femicide nation. But there's also a really strong and beautiful feminist movement that was visible everywhere we went in Mexico City. Whether it was feminist activists painting a statue of Charles Darwin bright pink with the slogan, never again will a science be created without women, or the guerrilla takeover of a monument in the Christopher Columbus traffic circle. This feminist anti-monument is dedicated to women who fight, and it's a space in the center of the city where victims of femicides are remembered and their names and stories painted on black plywood and cement barricades. Just to give you an example of how strong the feminist movement is, this year the protests on International Women's Day, March 8th, attracted more than 180,000 people, mostly women and girls, to the streets of Mexico City, with protesters chanting, Ni una mas, not one more, the cry of women in a country where nearly 10 women are killed every day, and nearly no one is ever brought to justice for these murders. As one sign at the march said, the police don't protect me, my friends do. But that's what this feminist movement is about, an assembly of women, girls, and other feminized bodies who no longer rely on the state or other patriarchal institutions to save them. Instead, they're going to save themselves, and in the process, the rest of Mexican society. Witnessing all this feminist activism meant that it was no surprise to us to learn that the next president of Mexico would be a woman, and a woman dedicated to ending this violence against women. The two leading presidential candidates were Claudia Scheinbaum from the incumbent Morena Party and Sochi Galvez, running on an unusual left-right coalition of the PRI and PAN parties. Both put women's rights at the center of their agendas. Here's Sochi Galvez speaking to Latino USA last March. Did you imagine that a Mexico could exist where a woman could be running for president? in your lifetime. She says she never imagined that women could be in such positions of power in Mexico as they were always subjugated to the domestic sphere, making tortillas, bringing in the firewood. So I asked her how she defined herself, and she says that she considers herself a woman of the center left. And how do you define feminism? Yo creo en la igualdad sustantiva en todos los temas she said that she believes in equality for all women in terms of political, economic, and reproductive rights. And to emphasize why this matters to her, she told us she suffered violence as a child. This story has become a part of Xochitl Galvez's stump speech. Her father, she says, was a violent man who terrorized her as a child, one time, she tells us in the interview, he pointed a shotgun at her mother and threatened her. She says that they escaped, but that this experience marked her. And then I asked her what she thinks the solution might be for this kind of gender-based violence in Mexico. What Xochitl said to us was that women in Mexico need a support system in cases of violence, and that men need to know that if they commit violence against women, they will be prosecuted. Yeah, but despite all the feminist promise in Mexico, there is also a very strong anti-gender movement. There is a very real security crisis, and by that I mean high levels of violence, and a very strong Catholic and evangelical influence on politics. As a result, gender has become a boogeyman that scares many Mexican citizens. Yeah, I think that's true. According to Dr. Annie Wilkinson, who writes on the anti-gender movement in Mexico, we need to think about anti-gender ideology as a global movement, but consider how each anti-gender campaign has its own local flavor. 
For Wilkinson, part of the local nature of the anti-gender campaign in Mexico is that it uses the security crisis to scare people into following right-wing politicians and religious leaders. Violence in Mexico is threatening to everyone who lives there. According to Human Rights Watch, Mexico is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for journalists and human rights defenders, and for everyday people, too. Violent crime reached a historic high in 2021. And since 2006, thousands and thousands of people, many of them women and girls, disappear every year. Worse, 99% of this crime goes unpunished. So that's the sense of fear and insecurity people living in Mexico have been feeling, especially since the so-called war on organized crime began in 2006. The war on crime has resulted in a militarization of everyday life in Mexico. And there is good evidence that the military and police are committing widespread human rights violations. What you have is a population that's in danger, with no state form of protection. Add to this a lot of changes in the organization of the family, and you have fairly good conditions for a political movement to come along that blames feminists and LGBTQ people for all that is scary in the world. And that seems to be what is happening in Mexico. Definitely. And in some ways, we can also think about the Mexican anti-gender movement as a counter-movement to the feminist and LGBTQ legal victories. In our interviews, nearly everyone agreed that the anti-gender movement really took off in May 2016, when former president Enrique Peña Nieto announced a plan to change the Constitution to protect same-sex marriage at a national level. This allowed Catholic activist and National Front for the Family Congressman Rodrigo Ivan Cortez to unite a movement against a culture of death that would force so-called gender ideology onto families. According to scholar Karina Barcena Barajas in her work on the anti-gender movement in Mexico, this backlash against the proposed reforms included for the first time an alliance between evangelical and Catholic leaders. And Rodrigo Cortez directly linked Mexico's worsening security crisis to gender ideology, arguing that abortion rights and gay marriage were increasing the levels of violence because of the collapse of the traditional patriarchal family. Cortez's solution, a war on gender. This war includes attacks on abortion rights, gay marriage, and not accepting the existence of trans women, including fellow Congresswoman Salma Luevano, who Cortez has repeatedly called a man. Civil society leader in Mexico has been found guilty of gender-based political violence. This after he went on social media and described a transgender lawmaker as, quote, a man who self-ascribes as a woman. As part of the verdict, Rodrigo Ivan Cortez was placed on the National Registry of Offenders. He was also ordered to complete reparation measures, including daily social media apology. This anti-gender ideology activism came to a head in the summer of 2023 when a group called the National Parents Union and the global far-right Catholic organization Citizen Go demanded that the state's new textbooks be banned and even burned for infecting children with gender ideology and communism. Like far-right book banning groups in the U.S. such as Moms for Liberty, the National Parents Union claimed their children were in danger if they were exposed to these books. Yeah, using this image of an innocent and vulnerable child to create anti-trans and anti-abortion and anti-lesbian and gay policies is a fairly consistent tactic of the anti-gender movement. Vladimir Putin used it more than a decade ago when he passed the anti-gay propaganda law, making it illegal to discuss any LGBTQ existence in front of minors. That's what Ron DeSantis did last year with his Don't Say Gay law in Florida. And it's what book burners like Moms for Liberty in the U.S. do. Well, we all want to protect children. So I guess it's a good strategy. It's a brilliant strategy. Hands off my children in English. Or con mis hijos no te metes in Spanish are used to put so-called parents' rights over the rights of the state and educational institutions to decide what's best for our children. But of course, these so-called parents' rights movements don't protect all children. They purposefully deny the existence of queer and trans children. 
The idea that queer ideologies can infect children actually assumes the child is always already straight. That's how this anti-textbook campaign took off in Mexico. It claimed the textbooks would infect children with homosexuality <laughs> and also communism. When you were in Mexico, Laurie, how strong did the anti-gender movement seem? Well, we talked to a lot of academics and activists about what's going on, and they all agreed that the anti-gender movement has gained a lot of ground in the past decade or so. So that's what we want to talk about in this episode. But in the next one, we can be a bit more hopeful, joyful even, and talk about the feminist and queer resistance to it. Nearly everyone we spoke with saw the Catholic Church as central to the anti-gender movement. But they also pointed out that there's a long tradition of the separation of church and state in Mexico. For instance, Cesar Cruz, a researcher in the Gender Studies Center at Mexico's National University, believed that the Catholic Church is playing a strong role in the political anti-gender movement, but also that it shouldn't be, since there's been an official separation of church and state in Mexico since the mid-1800s. Professor Cruz explained how the fight over the separation between church and state came to a head in the 1920s civil war, known as the Cristera War. The thing is, historically speaking about Mexico, in the 1920s, there was something called the Cristero War to separate the church from the state, and it was a revolt, a local war that lasted several years. People from the church cut off the ears of teachers, for example, and people from the schools closed the churches. After this war, church and state were officially separated, but there is a party, at least one political party, which is the PAN, the National Action Party, which is openly a party that has alliances with the Catholic Church, and for example, that party is very strong. It is very present, and there are people who are candidates candidates who go to political events with rosaries in their hands. Now, Morena is the governing party, and it is supposed to be a left-wing party. But the president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, for example, talks about the Virgin of Guadalupe, so it is not frowned upon to talk about it. Officially, there is a separation, but... Yeah, people definitely love the Virgin of Guadalupe, even radical atheist and liberal intellectuals. Yeah, I know. I've even seen Virgin of Guadalupe nightlights and air fresheners, and I don't think the people who had them were very religious. So people definitely saw the Catholic Church as central to the anti-gender movement, but also tied it to deeper and more historically embedded systems of heteropatriarchy in Mexico, systems that resulted in extremely high rates of femicide and other forms of gendered violence. Here's Karina Bacenas Barajas, who is the expert on anti-gender movements in Latin America. That's because she edited a book about exactly that. Bacenas Barajas is also a senior researcher at the Social Research Institute of the National University of Mexico. Professor Bacenas Barajas explains how she thinks the movement started in Mexico. Y justo estaba concluyendo esa investigación eh, con otros proyectos. When a presidential initiative was generated by then President Enrique Peña Nieto to recognize equal marriage in the Constitution, from my perspective, that was the beginning of the visibility of the anti gender movement in Mexico. And what this 2016 initiative reveals about the larger context is the visibility of new actors and something that I have named as the breaking of the Catholic monopoly in disputes over sexual morality, which was what we saw in a new way when civil society groups of an evangelical orientation. We had not had that, and even at the time there were those who minimized it and said, well, this is not going to happen. They have also been discriminated against the hegemonic weight of Catholicism. And it was this perspective of how a group that has been discriminated against, also stigmatized, is now going to discriminate and stigmatize. That also marked a break with religious belief, because it is not the conservative religious activism that we traditionally knew. 
several things were happening in Brazil that, for example, in the case of Mexico, happened two years later. I think that was also something that allowed me to see more clearly what was happening here, because I already had that reference of what was happening in Brazil, of how this whole issue was moving in the legislative body, especially in the Chamber of Deputies, with the evangelical bench and in the streets, how this and the slogan of gender ideology appeared or began to appear, and that led me a lot to also propose research in a comparative perspective. Also taking, taking, therefore, moments that were paradigmatic in the case of Mexico, since the presidential initiative to recognize this equal marriage in the Constitution, and in the case of Brazil, the impeachment against Dilma Rousseff, which finally also came to be a rearrangement of the evangelical actors. Tell us about this connection between different countries, because as I understand it, it is a global movement. Well, I believe that it is precisely the Latin American region that allows us to realize how this is a global phenomenon. And one of the first ideas that comes to mind is precisely the politicization and the reach that this slogan has had with don't mess with my children, which finally it is something that comes from the neoconservative movement in Peru. But I believe that it has been a slogan that to a greater or lesser extent has crossed the countries that speak Spanish in the region. And there we have as a first element. Another has to do with how these actors establish certain connections also through the presence of their ideas in different countries. We have the case of Agustin Laje, Nicolás Márquez, who, for example, in the case of Mexico, have made several national tours. Agustin Laje and Nicolás Márquez, by the way, are two brash Argentinian activists who wrote something called The Black Book of the New Left, Gender Ideology or cultural subversion. It's a huge bestseller, the kind of thing you can pick up at airports in Peru, Mexico, even Florida. This book has a rainbow flag and an image of Che Guevara with lipstick. And it argues that, well, that gender ideology is a kind of cultural subversion and will destroy us. Laje is hugely popular on YouTube using a combination of moral outrage and humor to convince his followers that gender is the enemy. He's kind of an Argentinian Ben Shapiro. Anyway, back to Professor Barcena Barajas on The Black Book of the New Left. This book was presented in the State of Congress at that time. And that was also thanks to the alliance with deputies from conservative parties such as National Action, Social Encounter, and civil society groups. All this, then, is generating a circulation of ideas, that these ideas of gender ideology are installed. It is a danger. It is something that we have to combat. It is something that they want to impose on us. This idea of dictatorship, of threat. Well, what's going on in Mexico? For some more about the Mexican context, here's Monica Uret who is working on some of these issues at the Monterey Institute of Technology in Mexico City. For Uret, the anti-gender movement is part of a misogynistic society and history. Well, my name is Monica Uret. I'm Mexican. I was born and raised and socialized in Mexico City. Let's talk about femicide. Femicide, where in Mexico there are between 9 and 11 murders due to gender issues per day in the country. It is a very serious issue, and it is an issue that not even the state recognizes. Rita Segato says that feminicide is a form of torture. Even more than rape, it is a form of torture. And feminicide, with these numbers, should be called femigenocide. And we thought, or had perhaps mapped it, that this only happened in the Maquila, in Ciudad Juarez. Sadly, Ciudad Juarez is known worldwide for its deaths, a phenomenon of the dead people in Juarez back in the 90s. It is not just a question of Ciudad Juarez, 
where there were certain women with certain characteristics who were also blamed for their own death, who were robbed, who were sexually tortured, who were murdered, and for whom there is no investigation as such. We heard more about the continual expression of misogyny from Cecilia Nunez, a specialist in communication at UNAM. Cecilia's job is to educate and facilitate inclusive language at the university. Sí, claro. Eh, hola, soy Cecilia Núñez. Soy jefa de comunicación en la Hi, I am Cecilia Núñez. I am the head of communication at the Coordination for Gender Equality at UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. At the university, I deal with the policies and communication strategies that have a lot to do with these issues, which are also very prominent in Mexico, within youth, but also in all sectors, right? The topic also, for example, of inclusive language, the use of inclusive language or non-discriminatory language. As part of her job, Cecilia monitors hate speech online, much of which comes from the National Front for the Family which is headed by none other than Rodrigo Ivan Cortez. We heard about him earlier, the Congress member who refuses to accept that trans women exist. It's also part of my job to read these hateful comments, horrible images they post, like the messages from people in male groups. These ones from these groups that organize to combat any kind of feminist expression in the digital space. So they have memes, they have horrible images that they have designed. I won't go into details, but they are horrible. It is not that they serve to reinforce, no. They also visually reinforce these messages of submission, like this message of you are behaving badly, you shouldn't be occupying public space, occupying positions of power, you should be at home, you should be washing dishes, washing clothes, and taking care of your family. You should be a sexual slave to your husband. You should have a husband, reinforcing with very strong graphic elements. Cecilia goes on to talk about how difficult her work can be at the university. She told us a story of a university professor who said that femicides were acts of love. Oh, my God. Yes, yes. I think it must have been around 2020, because I remember it being during the pandemic when I read a piece of news that hit me hard, which was a professor who said that femicides are an act of love. How can you be saying this? Are you really saying that femicides are an act of love? And he said, yes. Well, it is just that we have to think about how the man is in love and the passionate man suddenly doesn't know what to do anymore and then, well, he ends up murdering. So we published an infographic titled Reasons Why Feminicide Will Never Be an Act of Love. But it was incredible to have to create content like that, right? Yeah, that definitely shows a deep-seated misogyny in the culture. Of course, many observers see the anti-gender movement in Mexico not just as a continuation of the same old, same old, but a counter-movement that formed because the LGBTQ and feminist movements have been so successful in changing things. For Roberto Domingo Caceres, it was exactly the pro-woman and pro-queer successes that ignited the contemporary anti-gender movement. Bueno, hola, me llamo Roberto Domínguez Cáceres, soy profesor de tiempo completo del Tecnológico de Monterrey en el campus Ciudad de México. Hello, de México. my name is Roberto Domínguez Cáceres. I am a full-time professor at Tecnológico de Monterrey in the Ciudad de México field in Mexico City. I currently serve as Associate Dean of Graduate Studies for the School of Humanities and Education. I am in charge of the academic administration of 10 postgraduate programs in different disciplines, basically education and humanities studies. I believe that in the specific case of Mexico City in the last 15 years, there began to be many changes in the power of the institutional party that changed its name to the PRD, the Party of the Democratic Revolution, which started to make changes that were much more visible in the political organization. So I think that in parallel, that anti-gender movement began to rise up. But it's always been very clear to me that it's a right-wing movement, 
that would maintain all as it used to be. I think that through the gay marches, it becomes visible at that moment, that day, outside of there. Everything else that has to do with gender is negative, which is seen as something negative. That is, it is not talked about, or it is simply silenced or changed to something else. I think there is an element in gender ideology that says this is an invention. This is a, it is a derivation of feminism. So it is pointed out as negative ideas with respect to everything that is diversity, not just about gender, but rather that women no longer have participation on equal terms. It goes together with the gender agenda as well. And all of this is done by the right-wing party, which is very strong. And it condemns that women work, that women use contraceptives, that women have the right to manage their body as best suits them, to make decisions about their body of any kind. And it is simply said that this should not be done. So, the anti-gender movement is strong in Mexico. It is in the church, but it is also in the political system, and even in popular culture. Laurie, who else did you talk to about the anti-gender movement? Here's Norma Mogrovojo, a radical lesbian activist who's also a research professor at the National University. Norma has a podcast, Tortillas Sin Vecha de Caducidad, or Dykes Without an Expiration Date, that you can listen to over on Spotify. Norma describes her podcast as about lesbians over 50 for lesbians over 50. Ooh, that's for me. And she says it's an attempt to create space for these voices in a world that would erase them. Soy peruana de origen. Soy sexiliada en México. I'm Norma. I'm Peruvian by origin. I'm a lesbian feminist activist, and I'm a research professor at the Autonomous University of Mexico City. I'm a promoter of lesbian feminist schools of thought that reflect on the contributions of lesbianism to feminism, especially recovering lesbian theory or the genealogy of lesbians. That is my job at the university, and although it is more difficult, I try to make my line of work based on recovering this history. I believe that the Catholic Church is an undeniable power. It's not evident to everyone, but it is a political power and it is an economic power. This cannot be ignored. That power is always allied with the state. Whatever the government, no matter what the type of government, whether it's the right or the left, they are part of those patriarchal pacts that are going to be made. But for Professor Mogravojo, the answer is not more recognition from the state in the form of same-sex marriage. Unlike many of the other people we spoke with, Professor Mogravojo does not see state recognition of rights as a liberating prospect. For her, the state has co-opted much of the feminist and LGBT movements by offering things like same-sex marriage. And the state, regardless of which party is in power, left or right, is always deeply aligned with the Catholic Church. I'm going to say that I'm an anarchist. I don't have much confidence in the state, not in this one, and I don't believe in the role of the paternalistic state nor in the protective state nor do I consider that we need to be behind the state or dependent upon the state. And I'm going to talk about sexual dissidence, not about LGTB, because the LGTB concept is a concept that was coined in the shadow of the economic offers that came from the state for financing. Not that the state could exactly fund the movements, but the state would summon them to swallow up the dissident movements. And then everything that was the LGBT movement became a movement that was quite institutionalized and dependent upon the state. Therefore, for me, this is a sector of the movement that does not transform anything. I mean, they have fought for marriage, for marriage. That is an absolutely patriarchal institution that does not guarantee any structural change, but rather seeps into the dissident sectors to maintain the status quo of a heterosexual model of life. I really love Norma's critique of marriage in the state. Yeah, it's clear to me that Norma is a committed feminist, but she was extremely skeptical of gender as a concept. Before we started the interview, when I introduced myself as the chair of gender studies, she explained that she doesn't believe in gender. Erasing us as women is extremely risky. It is extremely dangerous because they erase our genealogy. They erase our existence. What is not named does not exist, right? 
So when gender is spoken of as a concept that encompasses men and women, for example, the specificity of women being different and having the problem of oppression and exploitation for being women is lost. So it is important to take up the feminist concept and the concept of women. Yeah, I mean, I see her commitment to protecting women and girls, but her belief that gender is a dangerous imposition that erases women seems less clear to me. Yeah, I guess for Norma, when we talk about gender, it can take the focus off of the specificity of oppression for women and girls. It can lead to what she and many other people describe as an erasure of the real problems faced by women and girls. But her skepticism about gender can also be seen as part of something else that's going on, something we talked about in episode three with Juliana Neuhauser, and that's the alliance between radical feminists and far-right politicians. We all know that politics can make strange bedfellows. And in the next segment, Juliana and her partner, Shaban Guerrero McManus, explain how a skepticism about gender among certain feminist activists is also leading to a hostility toward trans rights. Mi nombre completo es, depende como lo pronuncies, pero digamos que en español es Giovanna. Well, my full name is Siobhan Gemela Guerrero. I am Mexican. I'm a Mexican trans woman. My pronoun is she. I am 41 years old. I was born in this city. I have lived here almost all of my life. I'm married to Juliana, and I work at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I'm a researcher. I was originally trained in issues of philosophy of science and worked on issues of science and gender. But I have moved more and more to the topic of gender diversities and human rights. And that is precisely why I've had to experience very closely everything that has been the anti-gender movement in Mexico. I would say that not only have I tried to study it, but that I have had to play a role in this conflict in some way. Uh, my name is Juliana Stonehauser. Um, soy estadounidense naturalizada mexicana. My name is Juliana. Uh, I'm from the United States um, and I'm a naturalized Mexican. Yo. I am a trans woman. I am professionally a translator and I've always specialized in analytical texts, political and all that. And when that new wave of anti-trans movement started, then I also moved and started doing it myself directly, such as analyzing where it comes from, what interests are at stake, etc. Both Siobhan and Juliana see the anti-trans movement in Mexico as a result of this alliance between the anti-gender movement and a very strong radical feminist movement that really began back in the 1970s. Perhaps to give some background, Mexico did not have, let's say, a large anti-trans movement, but it did have a prominent figure in the lesbian movement. It was one of those that actually originated the lesbian movement in the 70s, which is Jan Maria Castro. She trained in the United States in California and brought some of the ideas, let's say, of Janice Raymond from the United States, brought them to Mexico. Janice Raymond, oh right, the U.S. radical feminist who wrote The Transsexual Empire in 1979. Raymond was arguing that trans women are really just patriarchal productions of what male surgeons think women should be. But that was the U.S., not Mexico, where there was a strong radical feminist movement. But it wasn't necessarily anti-trans. It's interesting that this all seems to have changed about eight years ago, about the same time that a lot of the people you spoke to say that the anti-gender movement got going in Mexico. It seems that all that changed in 2017. Many people are surprised that in Mexico it started so early because there are perceptions that in other countries this would start two years later. But in Mexico in 2017, with a lesbian feminist, Laura Lacuna, she published a text in 2017 in the Huffington Post that was called when trans is not transgressive. It must be said that she had not been an anti-trans feminist until she moved to Spain to do a master's degree. She did a master's degree in Spain, and it is in Spain where she encountered the positions of the group of feminists of Amelia Valcarcel and company. And it's in Spain where she became radicalized and returned to Mexico and wrote that text in 2017. A text that unfortunately was at the moment minimized by much of the LGBT movement. I answered it in a Facebook status that I never thought would have the success it did. 
And at that moment, in some way, we became antagonistic figures. It's something I didn't expect. It must be said that Laura began to follow the activism on Twitter in 2017, 18, and 19. Basically, she was interested in getting closer to the lesbo-feminist street movements, and she achieved this thanks to a group or various online groups, such as Witches of the Sea or another group like the Women of Salt. I guess what surprises me was how quickly these radical feminists made these alliances with the far-right politicians, the very same people who would like to deprive everyone of the right to abortion or lesbian rights. There was a very clear break when she began to approach not lesbo-feminists on social networks or street groups, but rather politicians of traditional political parties. Her first approach was to the deputies, senators from parties like the PRD, which was a historically left-wing party that, in fact, she was already approaching and was convincing them of these trans-exclusive positions that were informed, above all, by trans-exclusionary feminism. Not just from Spain, but she also had ties to British trans-exclusionary feminists. I believe it began last year, and that this is when a very explicit alliance became clear, because she is beginning to have events via the PRD, which has an alliance with the National Action Party. We have like two things that were completely different and at the time opposite, like the National Front for the Family as a quote, pro-parental rights movement and then the feminist movement that is increasingly separatist. And it must be said that the reasons why it became separatist were good reasons because there was a lot of machismo within the traditional left. That's a lot of political parties, listeners. Just to be clear, what's going on is that right-wing parties like Mexico's PAN which stands for National Action Party and Spain's Vox, joined forces with some traditionally left parties like the PRD, or the Democratic Revolutionary Party, to create anti-trans policies because of the influence of feminist activists like Laura Lacuna, who herself was bringing back anti-trans sentiments from Spain and the UK. In other words, this entire anti-gender movement is a global circulation of anxiety from across the political spectrum. On the far left and the far right, people believe that the collapse of the gender binary will mean the collapse of civilization. Another risk that I believe we are seeing, which I wouldn't even say is a risk anymore, but increasingly becoming a reality, is that it has given new legitimacy to right-wing discourses that can now be presented as left-wing discourses. This is because it is now legitimate to position oneself as not in support of transgender rights or even the broader LGBT demands while invoking a feminist stance. I believe this is already happening. I think that the Mexican left and the Mexican LGBT collective did not anticipate that hate speech itself is historically changing. And we got used to hate speech being associated with a religious discourse. And now we find ourselves facing a discourse that is secular, appeals to human rights, apparently appeals to biological sciences, and also emulates a classic leftist discourse, which is the denouncement, let's say, of hidden agendas. Historically, the left used to do that with a hidden neoliberal agenda within a movement, a class interest. And now we see, paradoxically, is that these kinds of arguments are recruited to say that, for example, the trans movement actually has a hidden agenda that serves the interest of pharmaceutical companies and big capital. These discourses that were historically associated with leftist formations and are used and actually allow conservative discourse to present itself as paradoxically more progressive and can lead a portion of the citizenry to sympathize. Moreover, there is an effective reconfiguration. It's no longer the old hate speech that positions you as the disgusting, condemnable, or despicable subject, as it used to happen when transgender people were focused on, for example, through the idea that sex work was dirty, contaminated anal sex. It's not necessarily that effective construction anymore, although it still exists. But now there is another effective construction that emphasizes that we are threatening groups such as children, religious minorities, and even women themselves. Well, let me see if I'm understanding what Professor Guerrero is saying. 
the alliance between trans-exclusionary feminists and right-wing politicians has changed the way anti-trans policies are being talked about. Instead of being about hating trans people as disgusting or sinful, now it's that trans people are dupes of Big Pharma, or maybe even that trans people are trying to take the rights of women and girls away by erasing the nature of their oppression. Is that right? Yeah. I think when she says the far right is now using left-wing ideas, like that there's a hidden agenda that benefits big corporations, or that the rights of women and girls are threatened, they're pretty successful at using what used to be progressive concerns to scare a lot of people into believing that trans rights, or gender more generally, is a threat. So instead of focusing on what the real threats to the right of women and girls are, like femicides, and lack of access to safe and legal abortions, the new rhetoric gets us to focus on trans women as somehow threatening the rights of cis women. As Juliana discussed in episode three, it's all pretty effective at shoring up support for anti-trans policies and politicians. You know, this is kind of depressing. We think about feminism as the way to fight fascism, but what does it mean when some feminists are denying trans people their rights? Well... It's definitely some feminists, but plenty of feminists continue to fight for the rights of all bodies that are marginalized by patriarchy and capitalism, what Argentinian theorist Veronica Gago calls feminized bodies. In the next episode, we're going to talk to activists who are standing up and fighting back against violence against women and other feminized bodies, including trans bodies. All right, that's it. You're going to do thank yous? Yeah. You're going to do that now? Uh, do you want to sing a song? You want me to sing a song? Yeah, don't we need a theme song? Oh my god, you want me to do that again? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to find some music. Okay. I do have some thank yous. I need to thank Patricia and Catherine for traveling to Mexico City with me. I need to thank all 15 people in Mexico City who spoke to us. No. But I won't do it by name. I also want to thank my research assistant, Harper, who, as always, helped string this together. Julian Sigurid for sound production. You, Allison, for being editor and executive producer extraordinaire. And, of course, our dogs, Mishka and Chloe, for taking me out on a lot of walks. Yeah. Yeah.